The next result to follow from the fundamental theorem of calculus is going to be the mean value theorem for integrals. Now, for the mean value theorem for derivatives, the main idea is captured nicely with a picture. So there, our mean value, which we interpret as the slope of a secant line, is equal to the slope of a tangent line for some x in our interval. And that's just our derivative evaluated x. So the picture there is just two parallel lines. Now, for our new mean value theorem, we're also going to have a picture that goes with it. First, let's state the theorem. Now, we'll have f continuous on a closed interval a, b. We're going to take the definite integral from a to b, f of x with respect to x. So this is just going to be the net area between the graph of f and the x-axis between a and b. The conclusion of our theorem is going to be there's going to be some x prime in our interval, such that if we apply f to x prime, okay, that's going to be the height of a rectangle. If I multiply that by the length of our interval, okay, so that'll be the base of our rectangle, so it's b minus a. The area of this rectangle is going to be equal to our net area over here. So the interpretation is I have an ant farm filled with sand. The top is going to trace out the graph of f. We shake it up until the top levels off. Then, if we just draw that line in, in our original picture, then that horizontal line is going to cut our graph at some point. It may cut it in a few points, but it's going to cut it in at least one point. Okay, let's take a look at an example. So, we're going to take the function f of x equal to x plus 2 on the interval from 1 to 3. So, if we plot this, f is just a straight line, slope 1, y-intercept 2. So our region is a trapezoid, the area is going to be equal to 8. Let's check that using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So we set up our definite integral. We need to find an antiderivative, so we have x to the 1, so if I add 1 to the exponent, divide, you get a half x squared, and then for the 2, we just attach an x. Then we evaluate it 3 and 1, take the difference. So there's 3, there's 1. I make sure I use parentheses so that I distribute the minus sign correctly. And then our answer is going to be 8, which agrees with our answer over there. Now, the mean value theorem says, okay, there's going to be this x prime, so that if I take f on x prime, multiplied by the length of the base, which is 2, then that's going to be equal to our area over here. So we want to find that x prime. Now, if we put x prime into f, that's just x prime plus 2. We work it out, we get x prime is equal to 2. So what does that say? Well, if we put 2 back into the function, we're going to get height equal to 4. So it's going to be this rectangle here. Now, the idea is going to be, okay, we take this line and just draw it through our original graph that's going to intersect at x prime equal to 2. So the idea is if we shake up this area, levels off at height 4, and the function takes on the value 4 at x prime equal to 2. One drawback to our mean value theorem. It's the same drawback we have for the mean value theorem for derivatives. It guarantees the existence of this x prime, but it gives you no idea how to find it. So. Let's look at another example. So I'll have f of x equals x to the fifth minus x on the interval from 0 to 1. We set up our definite integral. Okay, we're going to find an antiderivative. So we're just going to add 1 to each exponent, divide. So I have 1 6 x to the sixth minus a half x squared. We evaluate at 1 and 0, take the difference. That gives us a minus 1 third. So in this case, the graph of f is going to be below the x-axis over our interval. So this is going to be the area, but it's going to pick up a sign. Then this says the mean value is going to be equal to minus one-third. Okay. So the idea is 
I want to find an x in our interval from 0 to 1 with minus 1 third equal to, okay, we're going to apply f to that point. So it's going to give me x to the fifth minus x. Then we multiply by the length of the base, which is just 1. So if I want to know the x that gives me this height, I'm going to have to solve this equation here. Now, if I push that minus one third to the other side, okay, we're not gonna have a general formula for solving the quinic. So we're gonna have to go to numerical methods to find our answer. And then in that case, it's just gonna be an approximation. So options are gonna be based on things we've already seen. You'll have the bisection method or Newton's method. So unless we're willing to go to calculator or computer, we're gonna have to shut the problem down here to see why the mean value theorem is true, first show the following result. So we're going to assume the values of f all between capital L and capital U. So we have a lower bound and an upper bound for the values of f. Now, if that's true, we take the definite integral from a to b of f of x with respect to x. So that's our net area. That's going to be between the definite integral for L and the definite integral for U. Now, if L is positive, that's going to mean our function f takes on positive values. So our graphs are going to look like this. We're going to have the graph of the constant function L is underneath the graph of f, and the graph of f is going to be underneath the graph of the constant function u. So if we take the areas under each of these, this area is less than or equal to this area, this area is less than or equal to this area. And then that's just the statement that we have here about definite integrals. So, believable. Now, if we allow for negative values, okay, we're talking about net areas here, maybe not so easy to believe. But the inequalities are still going to be true. So the way you see that is just by using your old case. So what I'm going to do is, suppose we have our picture like this. L is going to be negative here, so we're going to add a negative L to each term. So we'll send L to 0 by adding negative L. We send F to F minus L, and we send U to U minus L. So we're just going to shift all of our functions up. That gets us to our case here. So the inequality is going to be true when I have L minus L, F minus L, U minus L. Now we could take that minus L out of the integrand. Okay, if you compute that, you get minus L, B minus A. And then each of these terms has a minus L, B minus A on it, which we cancel out, which gives us our inequalities, but with our functions with negative values. So it still holds. Now, to prove our theorem, we have a continuous function on a closed interval. So the extreme value theorem says our function attains its maximum and its minimum for some points on the interval. So we'll call our capital L the minimum of our function on the interval, capital U the maximum of our function on the interval. So that's going to mean, okay, if I put them in to our previous result, we'll have this inequality. Then we note we calculate those, those constants, you take the definite integral, you're just multiplying by b minus a. So get this inequality here. Now, b minus a is always a positive number, so it can divide through. It doesn't disturb the inequalities. So if l less than or equal to 1 over b minus a, our definite integral less than or equal to u, and note this term in the middle is what we're calling the mean value. Now, you'll note here what's the picture for this. So for instance, we're going to have, okay, u is going to hit the function at its maximum. L is going to hit the function at its minimum. So we'll have something like this. Then, because we have F continuous on a closed interval, the intermediate value theorem says that the graph of our function is going to hit every value going from L to U. So somewhere in here, there's going to be an X that when we apply our F, we're going to hit this mean value, which is between L and U. And that's the statement of our mean value theorem.